Hello and welcome to AIDS 2020 Virtual Daily, brought to you in partnership with Plus Life, where we turn positive into a plus. I'm Carl Schmidt. Today we have a compelling interview with Dr. Anthony Fauci, Director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases right here in the United States. Plus, we'll meet community members from around the world to ask them, well, anything. But first, AIDS 2020 Virtual shines a spotlight on science. So why don't we just start right there? Since 1985, the International AIDS Conference has helped answer the most pressing research questions in HIV. And this year is no different, although there is a new virus vying for worldwide immediate attention, COVID-19. Today's opening press conference will set the tone for the week with new data on the global HIV situation and breaking research findings on the intersection of HIV and COVID-19. UNAIDS will release a new report on the latest HIV data and trends with special chapters on COVID-19 as well as women and girls. We're also going to hear the results of a survey of over 13,500 LGBTQI plus people in 138 countries assessing the socio-economic impact of COVID-19. Oh, and on the prevention front, we have new findings from a Boston community health center examining COVID-19's impact on the delivery of prep care. Be sure to keep an eye out for all the exciting and groundbreaking news. Now, it's time to kick off our interview series with Dr. Anthony Fauci, a man well known to all of us in the world of HIV, but he's no longer our secret hero. As a man on the front lines of the COVID-19 response in the United States, Dr. Fauci is now as recognizable as Brad Pitt. Recently, I was lucky enough to sit down with him. Dr. Fauci, great to see you again. I know you're a busy man, so thanks for taking the time to sit down with us for AIDS 2020 virtual. Good to be with you. So let's dive straight into this. Um, based on the evidence you have seen so far, do you think that COVID-19 is affecting people like myself, people living with HIV, differently than those who are not living with HIV? So far, there is no evidence that there is a substantial impact on people who are in the class where they are living with HIV, but they're on therapy, their viral load is suppressed, and they have reasonably good CD4 counts. I think that you can make a projection that for those, and, and unfortunately we know there are many, uh, depending upon where you live and your access to care, who are living with HIV, but who have a substantial degree of immunodepression. And if that's the case, although we don't have data to say that they are going to advance to more serious COVID disease if they were to get infected with the coronavirus, I think you can make a reasonable assumption that they would fall into the same category as people who are on immunosuppressive drugs, for example. So I don't think for someone who has the capability and is implementing it of getting their, their, their situation with regard to viral load under good control, I think we'd be okay. That's certainly reassuring to hear. With the way this COVID-19 pandemic has, has taken over the world um, and is certainly eating into resources, how concerned are you that this is taking away from key HIV research and study? Well, I can tell you we're not getting off track from two, two standpoints. When you're, you ask that question, I think it has two components of it. One, are there resources that would be going to HIV that are now being diverted to COVID-19? And then the next question is, is the activity for getting resources that people are doing, is it being diverted towards COVID-19 and away from AIDS? With regard to the first question, there is no doubt, there is no diversion of resources that are AIDS resources, AIDS dollars, to actually divert away from HIV AIDS. No doubt about that. In fact, there are so many resources because of the emergent nature of COVID-19 that in some respects there's COVID-19 uh, dollars that are being put into situations that might ultimately in the long run benefit HIV AIDS. So because they'll be base dollars. With regard to activities, uh, there, the AIDS activities are going on. Literally, I just got off a conference call looking at the projection for monoclonal antibody studies for various stages of the different vaccine candidates. So HIV AIDS is in good shape. We are, however, and I want to be transparent about this, using what we built up 
for the clinical trials network, the infrastructure, the capability, the experience that our HIV AIDS investigators have in designing clinical trials and implementing clinical trials is being used to help this new field of COVID-19. So the AIDS uh, enterprise is making contributions very much in an intellectual way to how we address COVID-19, but it's not diverting the activity away from AIDS. I like also the fact that it's not just the intellectual contribution, but the social contribution and the lessons we've learned in the fight against how we treated those um, from, from a medical standpoint, but also from a humanitarian standpoint from the darkest days of AIDS to how we are treating people in this pandemic, right? Oh, there's no doubt about that. As a matter of fact, I've actually given interviews on just that topic of how we've learned about engaging the community, which it took us a while, but we had it so successfully done now. In fact, I'll tell you something that I think the, the HIV AIDS community should be proud of. The things that we did over years of developing community boards, when you develop protocols and how to engage the community so that people get engaged in clinical trials, that what they do is transparent and understanding and input. So we got called and said, how did you guys do it with HIV? And we told them how we did it. And we're using that model now as we prepare for vaccine trials and therapy trials. Uh, your institution, uh, the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases, uh, recently announced some very exciting results from a study of injectable uh, pre-exposure prophylactics, or PrEP, as it has become very commonly known. What makes that study important, Doc? And, and what do we hope to see in the next few years? Well, it's, it's part of a series of studies to take a look at the question, can we have people stay in complete remission, but be ART either free, namely substitute something like a monoclonal antibody or an immune-based therapy. But if not, can you draw out the amount of time that you have to get administered an ART? So we know that there is a thing called pill fatigue. Uh, and, and anybody that denies that, people do not want to be able to take have to take a medicine every single day that reminds them that they're living with HIV. Wouldn't it be nice if you could just do it every once in a while? Well, the long as long as it doesn't hurt too much. I don't want too much pain, Doc. <laughs> no, there's not too much pain, I'll guarantee. <laughs> and we know that from the study, but the study you're referring to is really a good study. It's long acting cabotegravir. And we feel that with some good chemical manipulation, of molecules that you can get a injectable long acting antiretroviral to be given at a much longer interval. If we could get it down to one every six months, that would be wonderful. I mean, to just come into a clinic or, or even to an outpatient and get an injection once every six months, twice a year, and know your viral load will stay undetectable would be absolutely wonderful. And that is doable. That's not just aspirational. Uh, you are also one of the architects of what some are saying is a very ambitious new plan to end the HIV uh, epidemic here in the United States by 2030. With COVID-19 coming in, and I guess this plays a little bit to what we talked about at the top of the interview, how confident are you at achieving these goals by 2030? You know, I, I, I can tell you honestly, I'm cautiously optimistic that we can do that because we're seeing some models in different places, in different cities. Uh, we are, uh, I mean, like the San Francisco model is, is a superb model of that. The New York model, which is copied after the San Francisco model, is actually doing, a, doing very, very well thus far. I think it is doable. What we're doing is getting out, and this gets back to one of your pre previous questions, engaging the community, but at a level that it is a, a, a feasible engagement. Like I always use the typical uh, uh, somewhat tongue in cheek uh, analogy of saying, you don't want a white guy in a suit like me going into the suburban area of Mississippi and, 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 and getting African-American gay men 
to come in and understand how they need to get on PrEP and how do we get them on PrEP if they're at risk and if they're infected, how do we get them into a program? You've got to go to the outreach and in the United States, and the, it could be a model for the rest of the world. We have a very heterogeneous population. I mean, the difference between the New York metropolitan area and rural Alabama is really huge. And you've got to fashion both your access to medication, your prevention therapy and other uh, trials according to the location and the demographic group. So I believe that since we are aware of that and we're paying attention to how you need to outreach the community, because those are the recalcitrant areas. I think most people know I'll be talking about this at, at the meeting, is that we have a very large country in the United States. There's 3,007 counties. Most of the infections are in like 50 of those counties, which is in some respects astounding. There are geographic and demographic concentrations. If we can focus our effort on that, then I think we could get to the goal of 75% decrease in five years and 90% decrease in 10 years. When you talk about those counties and you talk about the sort of the, the statistics of the rates of HIV infection, are you seeing similar statistics in the rates of COVID-19 in, uh, infection in those similar counties? Are they pretty aligned? You know, they are somewhat aligned. What's even more aligned is the disparity, particularly among African-Americans, in the seriousness of illness you get with COVID reflects the incidence of HIV among the African-American community. Because if you look at the general category of health disparity, we all know the numbers in the United States, 13% of our population is African-American, about 45 or more percent of all the new infections are among African-Americans, 65% of them are get men who have sex with men, 75% of them are young. So it's the young African-American men who have sex with men. They get hurt disproportionately. You switch to COVID, the same thing. You get a greater incidence of infection because your job, your economic status puts you in a situation where you can't do the zooming in and out. You're outside working exposed. Once you get infected because of the underlying comorbidities, highly disproportionately more in the African-American and Latinx population of hypertension, diabetes, obesity, chronic lung disease, kidney disease, all of those things make it much more likely that an African-American who gets infected with the coronavirus will have a poor outcome. Now, we recently lost iconic HIV activist Larry Kramer. You, of course, knew him very well. What can young activists or activists of the future learn from people like Larry? Well, Larry Kramer was a very unique individual. Uh, he was one of a kind. He, he, he started a whole new movement and transformed how we deal, namely we being the scientific, academic, regulatory, government community with people who are actually at risk or who are suffering from a disease, we learned that you have to pay attention to them. So Larry did it in an extraordinary way. He was outlandish. He was iconoclastic. He early on attacked me mercilessly <laughs> until we became very good friends. And, and then, then everything changed after that. But he got the attention when attention needed to be gotten. So what the current generation of people who want to do good for what they believe in is that you got to get the attention of authorities and explain in a way that they understand how your opinion and your outlook really counts. Dr. Anthony Fauci, you are what I would define an absolute hero, sir. Thank you so much for your service to not just this country through the pandemic, but to people like me living with HIV all around the world, we owe our lives to you and all the fantastic people that work alongside you. Dr. Fauci, thank you for your time and for being a part of AIDS 2020 Virtual. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. I love that man. He has a gift for translating science into regular human talk. As someone living with HIV, I thank Dr. Fauci and all his colleagues in the United States and around the world 
for the amazing gains in HIV treatment and prevention. We, those of us living with HIV, literally owe our life to science and heroes like him. Now, no matter how curious we might be, there are always a few questions that manners and good form mean you don't normally ask. You might feel embarrassed or you just don't know how to. Now, we've been lucky enough to speak to community members from around the world to ask them some myth-busting questions. Positive. I'm HIV, HIV positive. positive and have accepted to live with HIV. I was born with it. My HIV status is a private information that I choose to share or not to share. Absolutely devastated. devastated. Morally killed. Angry and panicking. I was unbothered by it because they explained me when I was seven years old that I didn't know that it was a big deal, just, oh, something I have. I was like, when you are fighting and suddenly you have a punch in your head, this is what I felt. I'm never afraid to disclose my HIV status. Yes, I was definitely afraid to disclose my HIV status because I was a version of self-stigma. In my daily life, I live as a gay man, often living with HIV. But does that mean I share my status with everyone? Also, no. Hmm. The first person I disclosed to was my mother. My best friend. My girlfriend. A friend who was also living with HIV. And his reaction was, how long have you got left to live? <laughs> his reaction was, it must be a false positive. If it wasn't. Yes, it was very hard for her as a mother too, but I know, I still remember her face. She held on strong to my hand to make sure that I knew she was there for me. The minute people learn that you're living with HIV, they start thinking, oh my God, you're HIV positive. Are you sick? That I can still be physically fit. They think that I'm going to die very fast. <laughs> and that HIV doesn't, and they think it does, limit who I am. Um, that there must be something that I regret doing and that must be making me sad, which isn't true. I don't look like I have HIV because I look healthy. They don't understand that uh, one can have a normal job, they can still have fun uh, as everybody else. They start believing that being HIV positive means one has got a certain disability or abnormality. Yes. No, I've never been discriminated at work for being HIV positive. I've been. I've been in dentistry, in social services, among some of my friends. In elementary school, when I was a surgeon, they didn't want me to involve with my classmates or teachers. Never to my face, because I feel that um, people are not brave enough, but very often, very regular, on social media, I get discriminated about my HIV status. Cyberbullying is a global issue. I experience stigma at hospitals every time I go for my routine checkup. Yes, it does affect how I see my future. My future, I felt, was something that was taken away from me. At first, I thought my future was slipping away, and then I reshaped my future. Now, the way HIV affects my future, is actually giving me something that gives me the ability to want more than I've ever wanted. Now I have a son, one year old son, absolutely healthy son. It's a miracle. No, actually HIV shaped my future to fight for human rights. How short does this answer need to be? <laughs> so many things. HIV is not a death sentence. sentence. I wish they knew that it, if you're on effective treatment, that it's untransmittable. I wish people could know that living with HIV, one can still be happy, one can still get a normal job that uh, a person not living with HIV can get. That HIV is not an obstacle to have a family, to give birth and to breastfeed. Not to waste their energy on ignorance because my HIV status doesn't affect anyone, but public health policies that enable ignorance and stigma to affect all of our lives. My God, it's 2020. People should know what HIV is. I'm sorry that you didn't have that enough information, but I will happy with you. HIV does not define me. 
what defined me is that I chose to live with it and I chose to fight against the stigma that defines who you people are. So if we don't fight for our rights, no one will. I want to thank all of the participants. Now, for more information about each of their organizations and the brilliant work that they are doing in HIV response, please see the comments below for their website and or their social handles. Thanks for joining us today. Be sure to join us again tomorrow for more science insights from this, the world's largest virtual conference on HIV science. And we've got interviews with Billy Porter and a special on-camera reunion with an HIV doctor working in a pioneering HIV and sexual health clinic who personally helped break the HIV news to me. I'm Carl Schmidt, reminding you to live your best life and turn positive into a plus. Music